up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. This one is called A People's History of Toronto in Brief, and the title is a tribute to this book, A People's History of the United States, 1492 to Present by Howard Zinn. Um, it's the 1999 edition. It's about 700 pages long. And as the title suggests, this tells the history of the USA from 1492, the, the moment of first contact in the Caribbean, which I described in episode two, from there right up until the Clinton administration. Um, of course, it doesn't tell the entire history because it's not possible for anyone to tell the entire history of anything. It's a particular kind of history that covers that period. It's a work of social history, which is the history of the lived experiences of ordinary people. So in some ways, that's like anthropology, but it's about the past, of course. It's, it's history. And on that note, you know, there's also things like the like historical ethnography and the anthropology of history. But the differences between these things are way beyond the scope of this series. That's a very specialized kind of grad school discussion. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that in more mainstream and Eurocentric approaches to history, that you often get the story from the point of view of the powerful, and the privileged, as if decisions made by a handful of individuals are what really drives history, and not the everyday efforts and lives and experiences of, you know, the millions of ordinary people who either, you know, are enlisted to work to make those changes happen, or who suffer the consequences of those changes, usually a bit of both, and I think Canadian history is especially vulnerable to this. We tend to get Canadian history from the point of view of, you know, so-called great uh, explorers, military leaders, inventors, entrepreneurs, bureaucrats, and um, that's a large part of why I hated history class so much in middle school and some of high school. Um, you know, 13-year-old me would have been pretty surprised that one day I'd be teaching parts of Canadian history at a university because of how much I hated history class when I was a kid. Um, I had one high school teacher who did an excellent job of it, but I didn't understand yet that what he was doing was in some ways social history. It was later on in undergrad that I came to truly appreciate what social history is and frankly found it quite mind-blowing. So Zinn took that approach and applied it to the history of the nation-state of the USA by telling that story from the point of view of indigenous peoples, enslaved persons, uh, immigrant communities, workers, soldiers, and, you know, I should add that he was also quite modest about doing this. He's very upfront in the first few pages that it's a partial history and that no one can perfectly, you know, replicate the point of view of a group they're not a part of, especially when that takes place centuries ago. But I still think it's a worthwhile exercise and it's an approach that someday I want to take to the history of the city of Toronto in full. So consider this video kind of a brief rough draft towards that, that dream of mine someday to do that project. So this, this video right here is, is the first draft of my people's history of Toronto in brief. I'll start by reviewing this concept of structure and agency, which is crucial in social history and, and very central to what I'm doing in this episode and a couple of the episodes that follow. Structure refers to the conditions that people find themselves in, political systems, the economy, the way wealth and power are distributed in their society. And agency is their capacity to do something about it, to make changes, to get what they need, maybe even to change things. Karl Marx said, or you said something like this, People make their own history, but not in conditions of their own choosing. So this episode today is a lot of structure. It's about those conditions in which people found themselves that weren't of their own choosing. How global political and economic patterns have touched down on what we now call Toronto. How, what, what that's looked like over the centuries. And... In the next couple of episodes, I'll get at some more agency, so some stories of what it was like to live through some of these changes in Toronto, especially since World War II. So Toronto since the post-war era, that's my main specialty as a researcher, and I'll be sharing some more of my ethnographic research in a couple of episodes. In the meantime, this episode is the kind of structural backdrop of the people's history of Toronto. <laughs> 
The story begins at the end of the most recent ice age, about 13,000 years ago. Some glaciers had melted and formed a huge lake that eventually became Lake Ontario. At first, the shoreline came up to that very steep hill that begins around Davenport Road. So basically, everything we now think of as downtown was underwater at this time. Uh, that's 13,000 or so years ago. After about 2,000 more years, that lake had drained to the point that its shoreline then stood about 20 kilometers south of where the lake shore now is. So around that time, meaning 11,000 years ago roughly, pe people began visiting and setting up camps in that area, in that, that 20 kilometer expanse that's, you know, south of where the lake shore currently is. Uh, they fished, they gathered, they, they hunted large animals like caribous, mammoths, and mastodons. So the ice age, as we call it, was technically over, but it was still very cold around these parts until about 8,000 years ago at which point the climate started to resemble something that we, that we recognize from our lives. Uh, the mammoths and the mastodons were extinct, but there were other new food sources that became available as the warmer climate allowed. And, you know, the very concise and simplified overview of the archaeological knowledge of this era um, is, is this. For the next few thousands of years, people continued to hunt and gather to set up camps and communities, eventually developing pottery and tools, and by about 1,500 years ago, archaeologists figure there were about 10,000 people in southern Ontario and a lot of cultural diversity among them. Many different indigenous groups moving from place to place, sharing influences and cultural practices and knowledge for millennia. The next era to look at came with the adoption of horticulture. Uh, the archaeologists disagree on when exactly that happened or why, but they tend to agree that at some point, in that constant exchange of ideas and practices and products that corn made its way to this area and other crops like beans and squash and sunflowers and tobacco. So horticulture or farming basically means there's a new reason for groups of people to stay in one place. Unlike hunter-gatherers who tend to go where they need to go based on what's happening in a given season, horticulturalists tend to stay with their farms for a lot of the year. And so archaeologists figure around 1,100 years ago, there were horticultural Iroquoian societies around the lower Great Lakes. Um, they lived in small villages that would usually last about 10 or 20 years when the buildings would start to get too run down and the soil would need a rest. And at that point, the group knew that they would need to move on to a new site and, and continue the same process. So it's a good point to review a bit of anthropological theory from earlier in the series. If you remember the idea of the modes of production, from episode 6 and Eric Wolf's study of the three main modes of production over the long run of human history, kin-ordered, tributary, and capitalist. So to start with the kin-ordered mode of production, you typically find that in small-scale societies, uh, people producing and sharing what they need in kin groups. So societies with a kin-ordered mode of production are mostly hunter-gatherers, and this was how most societies got what they needed through most of human history. And some societies continue to function in that way, but most of them are under intense pressure to, to give it up because their territories have been subsumed within nation-states based on a capitalist mode of production. And there was also the, the, the tributary mode of production um, found in many ancient civilizations and in Europe during the Middle Ages, and eventually this uh, in, in some ways turned into the capitalist mode of production. So to repeat, the first point is that not one of those modes of production makes a society more evolved than another. So in fact, the first peoples of what is now Toronto really fit Marshall Salins' description of, of the original affluent society. Or, you know, as, as Bobby Wash and Bobby Wash write in their historical overview, in which people spent comparatively little time on, on their subsistence. Um, but this does not mean that their lives were, were easy or simple. It was made possible through this, this complex, dynamic relationship with the land that was built up through millennia of knowledge and exchange. And, you know, cultures also don't change or develop in, in a straight line. So some of the indigenous societies that had existed when Europeans arrived in this part of the continent, for example, had horticulture, but their mode of production was still more kin-ordered than tributary, for example. Um, over time, some kept that while becoming part of some earlier forms of capitalism through their involvement in, in the fur trade, for example. 
The name Toronto, as most people now pronounce it, came from a Mohawk word that refers to fishing weirs that were built with sticks in the water. And that word was first used to describe the area up around Lake Simcoe, which starts about an hour's drive north of you know where I'm now making this video. Over time, the name started to spread south, basically. So you may have heard that Toronto means meeting place, which is what I was taught in school. And then some other sources uh, more recently said this was an error, but other sources still say that it's more complicated than that. That in a literal sense, Toronto referred to, to fishing weirs, but that those weirs were also meeting places or gathering places because many different groups shared them, um, used them for a wide range of purposes, for ceremony, for trade, for celebration. So as Bobby Wash and Bobby Wash put it, it's, it's a multi-layered understanding of a single term. One that, that brings in is it's natural, it's sacred, it's practical, and it's social meanings together. And it's, it's in keeping with the indigenous knowledge frameworks of the people of this area. There's debate around when exactly the first European reached the Toronto area and, and who it was, but it was definitely in the 1600s, and most sources still say it was Etienne Brule in 1615, which were violent times for this part of the continent. There was already conflict among indigenous groups in and around the area, and it became worse when European explorers and missionaries essentially showed up and inserted themselves into it. Probably the worst period in this was 1634, to 1640, when half of the indigenous population of the Great Lakes region died from new diseases that had been brought by Europeans. And uh, historians emphasize the, the, the long-term damage that was done as a result of this as well. So as Bobby Wash and Bobby Wash put it, many of the dead were elders, and so the communities were robbed of their leadership at a time when it was most needed. So trading networks among indigenous groups were destabilized, people were dispersed, and indigenous spirituality was undermined because traditional healers couldn't cure these new foreign diseases that were so devastating. And the wider context is largely as a result of the fur trade, there was this very complex political and military situation. There were alliances among First Nations um, and between First Nations and the French and the English. Uh, the Hurons, for example, were one of the conquered groups who were displaced from southern Ontario. And then the Seneca, uh, one of the five nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, set up two communities in what is now Toronto, one at the mouth of the Rouge River in present-day Scarborough and one on the Humber River in present-day Etobicoke. That they kept those for about 20 years, and it's not known for sure why they left, but one theory is they went back to what is now New York State in the 1680s, possibly as part of their war strategy against France. Next group that came to live here came to be known as the Mississaugas, who displaced the Haudenosaunee around 1700. As far as Europeans were concerned, the land belonged to France by that point. Meanwhile, British colonialism was in full swing, and they were often in conflict with France over colonial possessions such as this one. So the Mississaugas agreed to support the French in their trade and military conflicts with the British and with indigenous allies of the British. But by 1763, the British had won control of the land, again, as far as Europeans were concerned. Overall, one European power controlling the region instead of two competing over it was, was bad news for indigenous war and trade efforts. And plus, the British were causing more displacement by settling the land. So one result of that was a series of uprisings against the British in the years after the 1763 agreement. But that round of conflict came to an end after a couple of years, and the fur trade continued. Next major event in the region was the American Revolution, a huge topic that we don't have time to get into in fully. It's kind of a sidebar to the story. But what matters for our purposes is that it created a new reason for new groups of outsiders to come to what is now Toronto. So the, the Loyalists, people who had fought on the British side of the American Revolutionary War, now they needed somewhere to go, so many of them ended up in the British colonies north of the newly formed United States. That included the so-called Black Loyalists, uh, for the most part enslaved persons who had agreed to fight for the British in exchange for freedom from slavery. Uh, some of the Black Loyalists ended up in Upper Canada, but most of the Black Loyalists who came to the British colonies instead went to Nova Scotia. 
in this time after the American Revolution, the British settlers in the colonies north of the United States lived under constant fear of an American invasion. So in that context, Toronto looked like a good strategic spot to establish a large-scale British settlement. And out of that, we got the so-called Toronto Purchase beginning in 1787. The British paid the Mississaugas 1,700 pounds in cash and, and some, uh, some goods as well for Toronto. But among the many problems with this so-called agreement, the boundaries of the area to be surrendered were left out of the original agreement. And after years of uncertainty, the deal was revised in 1805 with boundaries that were greater than what the Mississauga had agreed to in the first place. Um, there were many, many other problems with this so-called agreement. Uh, and it wasn't officially on paper resolved until 2010. Uh, there's a video that I've linked in the description by the Mississaugas of the New Credit Council that adds a lot more detail to this and brings it to life in a way that I can't. So I recommend pausing this video here and then watching that video by the Mississaugas of the New Credit Council and then coming back to, to my history. The town of York was officially founded in 1793. It later became Toronto in 1834. But around the time of the, the founding of York, thousands of British settlers came into the area, fenced off common lands, in some cases committed extreme colonial violence against indigenous peoples. It's changing somewhat in the past few years in some slow, gradual, partial way. But I think the way that Canadian history has most often been taught is as if Nothing I've said so far really matters, as if the real history of the place begins with the moment when, when many Europeans started living here. In terms of how Torontonians see themselves, that kind of erasure has been happening all along. So there's an historian named Victoria Freeman who did a study of, of Toronto's 50th anniversary celebrations in 1884. So just to recap, uh, the town of York was founded in 1793. It became Toronto in 1834. And so in 1884, there were 50th anniversary celebrations for, for Toronto. And there's an historian who wrote an article in 2010 about you know this moment in history when Toronto was looking back at an earlier point in its history. And she found that many of the things I've just mentioned, the Mississauga Purchase, the, the dispossession of the Mississaugas from, from their land, had already been pretty much erased from local history and local memory from the perspective of, uh, of, of European Canadians by that point. So in those celebrations in 1884, 1834 was treated as, you know, the real beginning of Toronto, and everything before then was seen as irrelevant if it was discussed at all. And so the, the de facto message was that, you know, any British descended person who lived here in 1834 was an original inhabitant of the land, and, and nothing or nobody that came before them was, was relevant in any way. So that was the case in 1884, and the argument is those ideas have stayed with us and filtered down to us through history books, etc., over the generations. And I want to make it clear on that note that Indigenous peoples are indeed here throughout the rest of this history. But as Freeman put it, Historical memory is always fluctuating, it's contested, it's precarious, especially in Toronto, a city of newcomers, where half of its current residents were born outside of Canada. So for many Torontonians, the story of the place begins with their arrival, as it did for those newcomers who first established York and then Toronto. But the story that begins with arrival does not apply to the estimated 70,000 Indigenous people who live in Toronto now. And it's an example of what I said in episode 10, Canadian nationalism, of how multiculturalism as a part of a Canadian identity in some ways undermines indigenous sovereignty. And it revises Canadian history with this myth of inclusion and fairness. <laughs> So on that note, it's become common in recent years to begin a course or an event on campus with a land acknowledgement. So on this slide, I have a land acknowledgement that's often used at York University, for example. Um, I'll paraphrase parts of it and add some thoughts. It begins, we're on the traditional territory of many indigenous peoples. It's been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Métis, and is now home to many indigenous peoples. Uh, we acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is kind of like a peace treaty that was agreed to by the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee in 1763. 
And since then, everyone who lives here is invited to be part of this pact to take good care of the place and each other, basically. So I've provided a link in the description uh, to a video that, that describes the, the real purpose and the spirit of these, of these acknowledgements um, and much better than I could do it. So I recommend pausing this video and watching that one. It's called Land Acknowledgements, Uncovering an Oral History of Takaranto by Sarah Rock and Selena, Selena Mills. And again, the link is in the description. I recommend pausing this, watching that, and then coming back to the rest of this video. So back to the history, York's main purpose at the time that it was founded was as a military base, a strategic place to have one to try to prevent American aggression. Um, it's a bit ironic, maybe, because many people, maybe many other Canadians now consider the Toronto urban region to be the most Americanized part of Canada, which is interesting because the whole reason the city came to exist was basically to try to keep the Americans out of the British colonies. Um, next kind of big moment in our history is the War of 1812. The U.S. declared war on Great Britain, and one of their main ambitions was to take over British North America. Uh, England won that war, but York was attacked three times, suffered heavy losses. Um, and then in the aftermath, the city of York was booming. It emerged as a major commercial and governmental and port city, uh, over time replacing Kingston, Ontario, as the most important town in Upper Canada. And after a couple of decades of growth, it officially became the municipality of Toronto in 1834. Uh, the boundaries at the time were sort of the boundaries of downtown now, I guess, except the, the only the southern portion. Anyway, Bathurst, Dundas, Parliament, and, and the lake across the bottom. And there was an outer ring called the Liberties that eventually became part of Toronto as well. Uh, despite the boom years that this followed, there, these were very hard times for many people in this new city. There was extreme poverty, uh, fire was a common problem, outbreaks of deadly disease like cholera and typhus, and an increasingly unpopular and undemocratic colonial government. So in 1837, the former mayor, William Lyon Mackenzie, led an armed rebellion down Young Street, an attempted revolution basically, trying to overthrow the provincial government. Uh, it didn't work, they were stopped, they were put down. But within a couple of years, the government started making reforms, which arguably led to the Canadian Confederation in 1867. The next couple of decades are described as a period of modernization. So in the 1840s, uh, street lights, uh, waterworks were, were added, a telegraph line, and then railways in the 1850s. At first, the main industry that grew up around the railways was lumber and then manufacturing, and this is when the Toronto waterfront became a very busy industrial zone, and it stayed that way for over a century. Um, the shoreline was gradually extended by various landfills from this time up until the 1920s, which is why when you look at a map of Toronto, a lot of the lakeshore is made up of these, you know, perfectly straight lines. And it was made that way with landfill to make room for more and more factories during these, these industrial boom years. Uh, Canadian Confederation happened in 1867, not something I'll get into in great detail. The short version, what makes sense for our, what matters for our story most is, uh, it made Toronto an even more dominant urban center in this in this new country called the Dominion of Canada, which at the time was only four of the provinces at first. Uh, Montreal was still a bigger city at this point, though. It was the late 1800s when Toronto started to look like something that we might recognize as, as a modern city in some sense. So telephone lines, electricity in homes, paved roads, uh, eventually electric streetcars replaced horse-drawn ones. And this is also when some semblance of urban planning started to look like a good idea. Though in general, it was a mess. This was pretty close to completely unregulated free market capitalism. And so growth was unrestricted and unregulated. Uh, construction was often of low quality. There was a lot of corruption in municipal politics. So the elite lived in mansions and the poor lived in crowded and substandard slums and... Uh, there was then a round of annexations that kind of extend, extended the, the original city outward in all directions. So the last half of the uh, 1800s, a time of growth and expansion, but also this growing class divide. More of the same into the early 1900s, uh, more growth, more prosperity for the rich, which sometimes trickled down in some sense uh, in the form of more jobs for the poor and the working class. Uh, manufacturing was the largest source of jobs. The meatpacking industry in particular uh, grew pretty rapidly, especially pork. And so one of Toronto's early nicknames was Hogtown, which apparently was a reference to all the pigs being slaughtered in Toronto. 
but that's actually up for debate. Some say it was a reference to the greed of the business and the political class. In any case, huge population growth continued. So, for example, from 1901 to 1941, the population tripled. So, by World War II, the population of the city was about 670,000. As I said before, uh, the city was very sharply divided by class. Poor people lived in inner-city slums or in self-built shacks around the outskirts of the city without running water, without heat. People got around the city mainly on streetcars that were run by the Toronto Railway Company. Not public transit, but a privately owned monopoly known for poor service. Uh, the TTC was formed in 1910 and uh, sort of competed with that private service until 1921 when it took over the whole transit system. So the hard times continued. Um, an estimated 13,000 Torontonians died in the First World War. And right when it was ending, the Spanish flu pandemic killed another 1,300 people in the city. Then the Great Depression happened, and the unemployment rate reached 30% in 1933. Homelessness increased, uh, the poor kept living in slums, the, the middle class also felt the pinch. Many of them had to move out of their large single-family houses into smaller suburban properties because they couldn't afford servants anymore, and those old houses were converted into rooming houses. So by this time, this was pretty much what the city looked like. There was very loose zoning regulations, unplanned neighborhoods. So there was a financial core. There was a shanty town nearby, inhabited largely by recent immigrants, and then a shack town fringe around the outside. So around this time, other major North American cities like Chicago were looking at ways to transform the situation into something more functional and more centrally planned. But that didn't really happen in Toronto until the 1940s. During the Second World War, Toronto saw the same industrial boom as many North American cities did. New factories built specifically for the war effort, uh, older factories started making weapons and ammunition. And in the aftermath of World War II, you could say Toronto was a sort of microcosm of the political and the ideological trends across the West at the time, which I've outlined briefly in the last couple of videos. The idea was there needed to be a new approach to organizing society, and cities in particular, to avoid the kind of chaos that had come in the aftermath of the First World War. Disease, class conflict, slums, etc. So this was the beginnings of Keynesian economic policy in Toronto. The Toronto Reconstruction Council was set up in 1943, for example, as an agency to guide the, the modernization of Toronto according to a sort of master plan rather than just letting it happen ra randomly like it did in the past. Uh, unemployment insurance was created in 1940, family allowances in 1946, and these are examples of things that we now take for granted but that came out of this era and they were guided by the idea that the government should intervene more in the economy and in the social structure to avoid extreme inequality and the extreme unpredictability of, of the business cycle when it's not regulated. And this led in many ways to, to good times for a lot of people, a very low unemployment rate, uh, well-paying jobs for the working class by today's standards anyway. So the classic example is the automobile assembly line worker who can afford to buy the cars they produce on the job. So car ownership became common and then normal in the late 40s and into the 50s. Into the second half of the 20th century, much of the structural story can be summed up by looking at three interrelated processes that have transformed Toronto, especially since the 1970s. And those three processes are neoliberalism, deindustrialization, and multiculturalism slash systemic racism, which I'll talk about each of these in turn. I made these points two episodes ago in the entire episode about neoliberalism, but it's, it's worth doing a bit of review. Um, short version of the story is capitalism nearly fell apart during the Great Depression in the 30s, and in the aftermath, the thinking was governments need to do more to prevent this kind of mess, to prevent that level of social inequality and the wild ups and downs of the, of the business cycle. So the thinking was, let's do this through Keynesian economic policy. Uh, one goal of that was to make sure workers were well paid, well housed, and allowed to unionize, because if all that's the case, they will be healthier and happier, and they'll buy more stuff, which works well for everyone. Uh, what happened next, the short version, Western economies were very rocky through much of the 1970s due to this wide range of complicated local and global factors, and neoliberalism emerged as the new alternative, this theory of political and economic practice 
that proposes that human well-being is best secured by private property, free markets, and free trade. And this is the dominant set of logic that has structured the global economy and politics since the late 1970s. Meanwhile, we see deindustrialization. So in Toronto, the local economy was deindustrializing at the same time as neoliberalism was beginning to gain traction. So here are some stats to illustrate that. In 1951, manufacturing jobs made up one half of Toronto's workforce. They then they, they, they declined from there by about 25% each decade through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Then there was a major recession in 82 to 83, followed by a very strong recovery at the national scale. But in Toronto, recovery meant that jobs that were lost in manufacturing were offset by job creation in the service sector, and many of the jobs lost downtown were replaced by jobs in the suburbs. So by the end of the 1980s, the Toronto labor market was more service-oriented, more part-time based, and more suburban. For example, here's the former Coca-Cola building in the Thorncliffe Park community. This opened in 1964. It was a corporate headquarters and a bottling plant. Uh, those operations moved to Brampton uh, 10 to 15 years ago, and there was a long fight ever since over what to do with that property. And now it's a Costco. So. When I was a kid in this neighborhood in the 80s, some of my friends had parents who worked in the bottling plant for decent wages, and every year we got to go on a class trip to the Coca-Cola plant, and we were taught to feel this, this pride in our neighborhood's, you know, industriousness. So the whole area at that point was full of other factories and uh, low-rise office buildings. Now it's all condos and big box stores, and the general trend is towards low-wage, precarious jobs in retail. Meanwhile, throughout that transition, Canada was also becoming officially multicultural. So in 1966, there was a federal report that said Canada needed more skilled immigrant labor, which led to the policy changes throughout the rest of the 60s and through the 70s that made Canada an officially multicultural nation. So by the end of the 70s, Canada was increasingly diverse, if only because industry had said that it needed more workers. But by then, the industries that immigrants were recruited to come work in were shrinking, and manufacturing jobs were moving out of the suburbs. So more competition for fewer jobs, basically, which meant that racism in the workplace was very intense. So there were two professors from uh, anthropology at York who did a study on workplace discrimination in 1985. And the way they did this was they had actors of different ethnicities apply for the same jobs using fabricated resumes that illustrated pretty much the same qualifications. So here is what they found. They found that white applicants were three times more likely to be offered a position than black applicants. For example, uh, they found that South Asian applicants were four times as likely to be told the position was already filled than white applicants were. And, you know, this was 1985. You can Google this. There have been more recent studies along the same lines that, that found similar results. This image on the slide is just one of many examples of Toronto's multicultural neighborhoods. This is Thorncliffe Park Drive in what used to be East York, around the corner from the new Costco that I described a couple of uh, minutes ago. Thorncliffe Park is a very dense neighborhood of huge apartment buildings that were built in the 1960s. Originally, these were designed as upscale accommodation for people with office jobs downtown or industrial jobs in the suburbs. Sort of the, the new upwardly mobile, lower middle class, I guess. Over time, people who could afford high-end apartments instead wanted to live downtown. And so neighborhoods like Thorncliffe Park instead became known as, as the first stop for new immigrants who had just moved to Canada. So when that happened, the landlords started to put less money into maintaining and repairing the buildings because they were no longer being marketed as luxury accommodation. So in, by the 1980s, when I grew up in Thorncliffe Park, many of the buildings were in pretty bad shape and many of the residents were new Canadians, whereas the white residents who could afford it had either moved downtown or, or moved to Barrie to, 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 or other places in, in the suburbs. So due to racist bias and an overall misunderstanding of this whole situation, many people blamed the decline in the quality and the availability of housing on new immigrants, and so neighborhoods like Thorncliffe became stigmatized. And that's the story of Thorncliffe Park Drive, it's the story of Jane and Finch, it's the story of large parts of Rexdale and Scarborough and, and much of the, the greater Toronto area. So that was the backdrop, neoliberalism, deindustrialization, and systemic racism. And what I just showed you is what that looked like in what we call the old suburbs. Um, as for what it looked like 
downtown, much of this can be explained with the concept of gentrification, which is what happens when middle and upper income earners move into formerly low income areas. This became very visible in downtown Toronto in the 70s and the 80s, and it continues today. And I'll talk about it in more detail in Toronto and some American cities in the next couple of episodes. Uh, For now, let's go back to neoliberalism with the so-called common sense revolution of the 1990s. At that time in Ontario, the NDP, the New Democratic Party, had been in power and was extremely unpopular. There was an economic recession. People were angry, looking for new solutions. And so the progressive conservative party, led by Mike Harris, won two straight elections in 1995 and 1999. And according to most local scholars, that's when the province of Ontario was restructured along neoliberal lines. So just to review again, neoliberalism is the idea that the state should intervene in the economy as little as possible so that free enterprise can thrive and pass the benefits down to the rest of the population through that promise of trickle-down economics. So here's a couple examples of what that looked like in practice. It looked like a 21% cut to the general welfare rate and the elimination of all public housing programs that were in the works at the time. Uh, They also amalgamated many smaller local governments into bigger ones. Best known example of that is the creation of the City of Toronto in 1998. So Toronto used to be six separate cities, basically, which according to neoliberal thinking, that's inefficient. That's lots of government. Why have six cities when you can have one? And so they took a vote on turning all of those into one government. And even though three quarters of voters said, don't do it, they uh, did it anyway. They said, okay, we'll take it under advisement and then did it anyway. So Toronto, York, East York, North York, Scarborough, Etobicoke, they all became the mega city, aka the city of Toronto in 1998. One result was a diminishment of services and citizen engagement in the former suburbs in places like Scarborough, uh, the city of York. So in that example, the city of York, there was a plan to build a suburban downtown at the corner of Eglinton Avenue and Black Creek Drive in the 1980s. And the plan was for this to be a a mixed-use development with a built-in GO train and a subway stop. But this was canceled in 1995 after the the Harris government canceled the Eglinton subway line, which was then under construction. So the line was already being built, and the government literally ordered that the holes be filled back in because the subway was canceled. Public housing was also targeted for a lot of uh, downsizing and offloading, so in the year 2000, the province handed off responsibility for public housing to municipalities such as the new mega city of Toronto, and then Toronto went about amalgamating those smaller agencies into bigger ones that didn't have enough funding. So if these agencies wanted to build new housing and maintain what they already had, they needed to make partnerships with businesses. So we'll come back to that in a couple of episodes when I tell the story of of Regent Park in, in more detail. Into the 21st century, we saw more of the same, more neoliberalism, more deindustrialization, more gentrification, but also some exceptions. Uh, The liberals were in power from 2003 to 2018. Uh, The mayor from 2003 to 2010 was David Miller, an an environmentalist lawyer, basically. Uh, Recent urban studies uh, scholars locally call this an era of third-way urbanism, the idea that we can have kind of the the best of both worlds, of neoliberalism and something like Keynesianism, I guess, that we can have a a free market economy where a lot of services are privatized and, and, and kind of downsized and minimized. We can have that, but we can make it work for everyone with pleasant ideas like social inclusion. And I'll come back to what that means or what it's supposed to mean in in a couple of episodes. And this brings us to the current era of the past decade or so. And you can think of that as beginning with the election of Rob Ford as mayor in 2010, which many people say is a strong sign of this global trend towards right-wing populism unfolding right here in Toronto. So Ford himself was a city councillor in the 90s. City councillors aren't usually the most high-profile politicians, but even back then he would show up on the news once in a while for things like drunk driving or domestic violence allegations or saying something racist in the media. So when he ran for mayor in 2010, at first, some people thought he was like a joke candidate who had no real chance of winning. So obviously they were wrong, and uh, he proved very, very popular. And it's been said that a lot of his appeal stemmed from his his pandering to working class people, especially in the inner suburbs. So it's an example of populism, which in short means the attempt to kind of appeal to ordinary people 
by claiming to defend them against some kind of elite. So in this case, Rob Ford managed to sell himself as a kind of regular guy from Etobicoke who was trying to do something nice for the regular people of the city. And in the meantime, he would rant against the, the elitism of uh, the downtown liberal left, or whatever he called it at the time. Good example of that was uh, his claims to target corruption in subsidized housing. This was often what he, what he meant when he talked about stopping the gravy train. But while he was targeting specific, you know, well-paid executives in, in the housing field for making too much money, for example, he would also vote against money being spent on repairs to public housing. Uh, his government also started privatizing garbage collection, uh, cut TTC routes, replaced an earlier transit plan with the Scarborough subway extension, which is now down to one stop. And arguably his brother Doug Ford used pretty much the same kind of rhetoric and posturing to win his current post as, as premier, even though they come from a millionaire business and political family. So to wrap up and review some key points, we're on land that's been inhabited for about 11,000 years, but there's a tendency in our media, our culture, our education systems to think that only the last 400 or so years counted or mattered. And I think that is slowly starting to change in some way. The society that's been established since then has traditionally seen itself as, as a microcosm of Great Britain. And that only really started to change in the 1970s. And it's also a society where a majority of the population has been very vulnerable to the instability and the inequality that comes with the capitalist mode of production. So everything I just said, that was all structure. We'll look at a bit more structure in the coming episodes when I talk about how, how similar trends have played out in American cities. But I will also say some more about agency based on my own ethnographic research for the most part. So what ordinary people do about all of this, how they create community, how they push back, how they get by, that's all coming in the next couple of episodes. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks.